So, who am I and why am I here? Uh, my name is Megan Garley and you might be wondering why I'm here talking to you about old buildings and a little bit about archaeology. Um, well, I moved to Southbridge when I was a kid and I actually lived in an old AO house um, and I always found the history of it very fascinating. So then after high school, I grew up here, then after high school I went and I moved to Winnipeg, Manitoba uh, and I did a Bachelor of Arts um, Honours in Anthropology with a minor in German. Um, and during my undergrad, I did a bioarchaeological field school at the Fortress of Lewisburg in Nova Scotia, where we excavated about 35 of an estimated 1,100 individuals who were buried on Rochefort Point that were under the threat of coastal erosion. I then went on to attend Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, where I did my master's in archaeology, which I actually just graduated from about three weeks ago. Uh, thank you for you. Um, with a focus in bioarchaeology. Um, bioarchaeology, if you don't know, is the study of humans in the past and includes the study of human remains. My thesis is titled An Isotopic Investigation of the Diet and Origins of 18th and 19th Century Individuals from Newfoundland and Lewisburg, Nova Scotia. This research used isotopic analysis to examine the diets and likely origins of individuals buried at several sites on the Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland, uh, as well as within the city walls of the National Historic Site of the Fortress of Lewisburg in Nova Scotia. I then worked for two cultural resource management uh, companies here in New England as an archaeologist, and I excavated all over New England, including New Hampshire, Vermont, and here in Massachusetts. I even dug a job last year uh, over in Charlton. Um, I've now switched gears a bit, and I'm working here at Jacob Edwards Library, but I still get to do a little bit of research, which I really love. Now, what am I going to talk about today? So, these are just the little titles I always like. I'm stuck in my grad school ways. I need to give a little uh, table of contents before I get started. So I'm just going to touch on a lot of subjects a bit briefly. Um, this is my first research project about Southbridge, so maybe down the line I'll get to do a little more in-depth one. Um, but I'm going to touch a little bit, just a teensy bit, on the geology of the area, uh, the Quinnebog River Prehistoric Archaeological District, archaeology and human habitation, Honest Town, manufacturing and mills, um, then go a little more into detail of Globe Village, then touch on the work of Eileen Woodford and uh, other historic buildings in Southbridge, and then do some final thoughts. So, to begin, as I said, the archaeology Archaeologist in me needs to briefly discuss uh, the land on which we are standing or sitting. Uh, New England's landscape is glacially formed. Uh, the retreat of the ice sheets during the most recent glacial period, the Wisconsin, occurred uh, about 12,000 to 15,000 years ago. And landforms like drumlins and kettle ponds, which are common in New England, were formed when the glaciers rece uh, receded. Um, these mountain building events from the Acadian Orogeny, uh, which was about 365 to 425 million years ago, um, which was the third of four that helped create the Appalachian Mountain chain, um, these mountain building events can be inferred from tilted planes of rocks, which we can see on various properties in Southbridge uh, and at numerous sites nearby, and uh, these are evidence of uh, thrust faulting. And the rocks in Southbridge area are most usually granite igneous rocks or granite gneiss, which are metamorphic. So this is just a picture of um, those two pictures on the right there of our uh, lead mine pond over in Sturbridge area. Um, and then this is just a geologic map of Massachusetts. So I'm just going to give a quick little background on the archaeology of the area to give a little context to the pre-colonial settlements in the area that we are uh, currently living. So southern New England has been occupied by people for about 11,000 years, and about 10,000 years ago the Ice Age came to an end. However, the climate and environment did not take on the character that we see today until about 5,000 years ago. Archaeological sites that predate 8,000 years are not very common across New England. However, sites dating after 8,000 years ago are much more common. During this period, uh, nearby stone quarries of quartzite were routinely used 
uh, suggesting a, famili a familiarity with and a reliance on more uh, local raw materials for stone tool manufacture. At this time, oak forests spread across the state, and it is likely that deer, bear, and turkey became more common. Small game, fish, and plant foods probably remained most important parts of their diet. Uh, the Quinnebog River, at some point, began to support larger local um, Native American populations. Um, there we go. The hunting and gathering way of life continued pretty much unchanged until about 3,500 years ago. After about 3,000 years ago, pottery was increasingly used in the region and it replaced bulky soapstone bowls and platters. In general, the archaeological record suggests an intensification in the use of wild plant foods at this time. The Native American way of life that we are most familiar with uh, here in New England is based on the planting of maize, beans, and squash, also known as the Three Sisters, as you can see in that lower right-hand picture there. This only developed about a thousand years ago. Uh, the transition to a gardening way of life appears to have been very gradual, and by about 1300 AD, some communities along the Connecticut River Valley probably developed village-based communities associated with large fields of corn. The Nipmuc people, who were in the country long before any settlers came, uh, once used the area for graphite mining. Eventually, European settlers arrived and continued to use the area for the same purpose. So, Southbridge and Sturbridge sits at an important Native American crossroads from both a land and a water perspective. Um, Native Americans uh, had used waterways as roads Rivers and streams were their transportation corridors. The pictures we have in our heads of um, people paddling along in birch bark canoes, as you can see in this top picture, is based in fact. Those were used in this area. The Quinnebog River is the most important natural feature in the town of Southbridge. The river cuts a narrow, steep-sided valley through the north-central portion of the town. Its course winds southeasterly through Southbridge, dropping more than 100 feet in elevation. And good water power sites were later found uh, along the river, but also along several of its tributary streams. The Quinnebog River uh, corridor provided transportation routes through steep highland ridge and valley belts, with transport um, focused at river fords. Several trail systems uh, exist along it that run through Southbridge itself. And the Quinnebog uh, Corridor Trail south of the river, along River Road, and the one, the north-south trail to Woodstock from Westville uh, are other important trails. The main uh, north-south route that eventually became a path from the settlement at Woodstock to that at Brookfield, and the east-west trail became part of the route from Boston to Springfield. In the mid-18th century, when Native Americans were losing their land to settlers, they often lived under the radar, um, so they might have worked at the Sturbridge lead mine during that time, but they tried to uh, continue to observe traditional practices uh, to the extent that they could. So now on to Honest Town. In 1633, John Oldham traveled from Massachusetts Bay to uh, the Connecticut River. He and three other men arrived in Tintasqua, the name given by Native Americans to the territory, which today encompasses Sturbridge and Southbridge. Tintasqua is one of New England's very first mining operations, a little fun fact. In 1644, John Winthrop Jr. was granted a plot of land on which uh, the lead mines in Sturbridge exist. And the first colonial settlement in the area uh, was in 1730 by James Dennison, who came from Medfield whose shelter was a rock cave that he used while clearing land in the fall. His daughter, Experience, was born on August 31st, 1732, and he was the first, uh, she was the first settler child born here in town. Moses Marcy started uh, the first mills in the 1730s uh, with saw and grist mills, um, which attracted development prior to the official settlement of the town. A house for public worship was built uh, by 1733 and had its first pastor by 1736. Before 1744, Mr. Samuel Freeman uh, was the first whose home was located here in the center of town. 
Felix Gatineau wrote that the picturesque site of our village and the many advantages that it promised in terms of industry and commerce quickly drew a flock of co uh, colonists to the area. And it is said that John Gray, who sold clothing, was the first to do business here in the village around 1790, and Oliver Plimpton opened the first store in 1791. By 1796, population reached numbers sufficient to generate interest in independent status as a town or parish. In 1798, there were 72 taxpayers in the Sturbridge portion, 23 in Dudley, and 20 in Charlton. When the petition of 1800 was signed by 87 men, and when it was incorporated, included 90 men. The formation was unusual in its organization by individuals rather than territory. And it was remedied in 1808 when the later owners and occupants of the estates were ordered to act as the original petitioners in parish affairs. In 1814, when the petition was made for the town, 177 men signed it. So early names for the town included Honest Town and Vienna, which we obviously did not go with. <laughs> the name Southbridge seems to have been proposed by the venerable Captain Abel Mason when the town was incorporated in 1816. And according to Felix Gatineau, that name comes from the bridge that crossed the Quinnebog River on Central Street down in the south portion of town. The first municipal meeting was held on March 6, 1816, and the following officials were elected. Captain Gershom, Major Samuel Fisk, Joshua Mason, William Morris, and Fortis Foster. The total population by 1820 was 1,066, and in 1830, it was 1,444. Just as the town was unusual in its pole parish status, the initial church formation was also non-traditional. Acknowledging the diversity within their large population, the parish agreed to build a meeting house that would be shared by several different denominations. The Congregationalists uh, were organized by 21 men and women in 1801. They were incorporated as a parish within the new town of Southbridge in 1816 and included about 60 men and their families. The Baptists formed a society the same year uh, and included about 120 men and their families. They took over the original meeting house building. Methodists and Universalists also worshipped in the town but had not yet formed official societies. Oak Ridge Cemetery, which is just down the street here, uh, was granted as a one acre burying ground from Colonel Benjamin Freeman. And the first burials uh, in God's Acre uh, occurred in 1801 and included the children of Gershon and Oliver Plumpton, as well as Ebenezer Clark, all who were buried there in August. <coughs> the common uh, was gifted by Captain Marcy, and it's not where we think that the common is today. It was actually over here on Main Street, um, but it was not kept as a common, uh, and later that was moved. So the first 100 years of the community was focused on agriculture, establishing farms, uh, farmsteads and processing mills along the Quinnebog and its tributaries. As late as 1811, settlement continued to consist of dispersed farmsteads, with a small cluster of buildings around the 1797 Baptist Meeting House at the Main and Elm intersection. When textile manufacturing was introduced in 1813, three distinct industrial clusters uh, were developed by 1830. Growth in the center village extended west of the Baptist Meeting House toward Central Street and south along Elm to the Congregational Meeting House. A cotton mill uh, was built in 1813 on the north end of Central Street, with worker housing north of the Quinnebog River on Page Hill Road. The first hotel in Southbridge was built in 1825 and is, uh, was located where the fire station on Elm Street uh, is today, and it was called Freeman's Tavern. A second industrial center uh, developed at Globe Village uh, with an 1814 cotton mill and an 1816 brick mill. The village was established north of the river with worker housing along Main Street. A secondary residential cluster uh, developed southwest of the Globe Village uh, at the south and west street intersection. 
A third industrial development occurred southeast of the center village uh, around the housing on the south side of Main Street. Small secondary hamlets uh, developed in the, south, the southern part of town uh, at the Alpine Drive, Brickyard Road, and Lebanon Hill Road intersection. In addition to the saw and grist mills along the Quinnebog, cotton spilling and wool carting mills began to appear at a number of water privileges and attracted additional sediment during the early years of the 19th century. Increasingly, intensive use of land adjacent to and south of the Quinnebog River led to the replacement of early structures there, while the persistently agricultural outlying areas saw reconstruction as well. None of the town's handful of non-residentials survive. Its meeting house, early mills, or taverns, and only a handful of residences uh, retain sufficient integrity to be discussed here. The first cotton mill was built in 1811 at Westville and cost about $6,000. The first wool manufacturer was established in 1813 uh, near where Central Mills is. Globe Manufacturing Company, a predecessor to the Hamilton Woolen Company, was incorporated by an act of legislator in 1814, and this company is what gave the name Globe to the part of the village on which it stood. At the time, Southbridge was on the fast track to progress and was claiming its place in the spotlight. Industry was changing uh, the village from one day to the next. The cotton and wool mills had many supporters, and by 1818, the important Dexter, Harrington, and Sons cutlery factory had been established. The first major concentration was at Globe Village due to the success of the Hamilton Woolen Company, their significant building campaign, and the influx, influx of textile workers. The industry that made Southbridge famous was the eyeglasses and optical instruments industry. While the industry was not born here in Southbridge, they started manufacture, manufacturing lenses here in 1833, thanks to William Beecher. From then until 1869, the year the American Optical Company was formed, the eyeglasses industry passed through several hands, with the last to run it being Robert H. Cole, who then became president of the AO Company, along with his associates George W. Wells as assistant and E.M. Cole as treasurer. With the establishment and growth of the American Optical Company during the late 19th century, the vicinity of the Columbian Mills and Lensdale area grew rapidly, and the AO became the dominant employer. Between 1872 and 1935, the town's prosperity was based on a healthy manufacturing sector and attracted continued growth. Next, I will go into a little more details regarding the mills and man manufacturing. So, Southbridge's location on the Quinnebog River placed it in a favorable location for a mill town. Water power from the river would play a role in running the machines of the mill down the road. Manufacturing brought people to work jobs in factories, which led to the expansion of homes in the town. Many homes were owned by mill companies and leased to tenants who worked for the mills. People with jobs higher up within these companies often built their own houses, usually nearby. The setup of streets was linked to how easily they could move to and from work. By the early 1820s, three Quinnebog River Mill sites were well established. These included Globe Village, Center Village, and the Columbian Mills, which were later known as Lensdale. These were all originally used for textile manufacturing and became the focus of the development of a string of mill villages between 1831 and 1871. So in, uh, there's a long history of manufacturing and mills here in Southbridge with um, just a couple important dates here. In 1814, the Globe Manufacturing Company uh, in 1818, the Russell Harrington Cutlery Company. In 1821, the Columbian Cotton Mill was built. In 1831, the Hamilton Woolen Company commenced manufacturing in the Globe Village area. In 1848, A&M Tool and Dye Company began and then later moved to Mill Street in 1957. And in 1875, the J.J. Delahanty and Company opened at uh, 858 Main Street in the Alden Building. So the period between 1831 and 1871 saw the successful establishment of the textile industry in town and the subsequent rise to preeminence of the Hamilton Woolen Mill Company. 
The accompanying prosperity and the variety of employment opportunities brought a tripling of the population with an increasingly differentiated social structure and a diverse ethnic composition. Two primary and three secondary nodes of development formed a string of mill villages along the Quinnebog River. And the small cl cluster at the central village uh, grew with the addition of commercial and institutional buildings. So while we're here looking at these uh, very cool mill buildings, we'll just uh, touch on the lives of employees. So in the early days, people usually worked uh, 12 hours a day uh, from 5 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. with 30 minutes for meals and no time off on Saturdays. Salaries for children were between $8 and $10 a month, and it was between eight or 10 and $18 a month for people uh, who were older. Because children were not required to attend school, they would start work at a very young age. Um, because of overwork or lack of care, many contracted uh, deadly illnesses such as consumption or tuberculosis, which send them to the, their graves. This later played a role in our child labor laws. Um, so each mill did have a general store where employees would buy their provisions and where they would settle their accounts every three or six months. At that time, they would get the remainder of their salary that they had earned. However, several uh, people often found themselves um, owing the company money. And this often put uh, families in debt to the companies for years. So, a little more on mills. The settlement of Westville commenced around 1738, with Westville being the name associated with the Sturbridge side and Shettleville the name associated with the Southbridge side. This area of Southbridge uh, is some of the oldest in uh, our history. Just above the valley where uh, Westville was found is the location that James Dennison settled. Uh, here's where the first sawmill and first established cotton mills uh, were in Southbridge. And the earliest attempt at textile manufacturing occurred in 1811 with the cotton mill that was established there, as I uh, spoke about earlier. Westville slash Shuttleville uh, is where the Litchfield Shuttle Company uh, came to exist around 1813. And no dam or water wheel was built here until the decade between 1825 uh, and 1835. Southbridge, along with Webster, can rejoice in a, a historic past of textile manufacturing. Southbridge actually contributed greatly to uh, the improvement of the process of weaving. Um, the first sawmill that Moses Marcy uh, built was in 1733, uh, to which he added a grist mill uh, before the last of September in 1736. The development of the water power at what is now Globe Village began around 1750, uh, with no other industrial enterprise recorded there until 1812. The business of manufacturing at Globe Village uh, began in 1814 under the name Globe Village Manufacturing Company with the first owners being Thomas uh, Upham, David Fisk, Samuel Newell, James Wolcott Jr., Perez Wolcott, Josiah Fisk, Francis Wheelcock, Wheelock, sorry, uh, Ephraim Angel, and Moses Plimpton. With the spinning beginning in the old mill, the old linseed mill of Captain Gershom Plimpton, which stood near the road on the south side. The factory building below the road was erected in 1815 and was at first and until 1817 a cotton factory. That year there was a division of the property among the owners, with the south side being taken by James Wolcott, Perez Wolcott, Samuel Groves, and Ephraim Angel, uh, and the other side to the remaining proprietors. Additions were made to the south side and the woolen business was established. And in 1820, the other owners sold out of the remainder of their property to Mr. Wolcott and his family, or his company, sorry. After this purchase, James Wolcott Jr., Perez Wolcott, and Samuel Groves changed the name of the company, and it was incorporated by the name Wolcott Woolen Manufacturing Company. That company was increased uh, by the new proprietors in Boston, who made investments uh, of a considerable amount. However, after the failing of the dam and destruction of property, the Boston owners were determined to abandon their concern and get rid of their interest. In 1829, it passed in the, into the hands of William, Willard Sales and Samuel Hitchcock. 
and in 1832, they obtained a new act of incorporation by the name Hamilton Woolen Company. The Central Mills Company uh, was the original name used uh, then by the company started in 1837 to 1838 to manufacture sheetings, carpet warps, wrapping twine, towel warps, and satinet warps. Um, they were a major employer well into the 20th century, and uh, they, along with Globe Village, were a forerunner of textile mills established after the embargo and the War of 1812, which formed the early foundation of Selfridge's economic growth. So just to speak a little more on Globe Village in particular. Um, as I said before, the Quinnipaug River played an, an extremely important role in the development of the town. Uh, the river itself rises at the west side of Leadmine Mountain, and its course is marked by a succession of large factories and workshops, which owed their existence to the river's abundant power. In the first 20 miles, the river describes nearly a complete circle, at length turning abruptly to the north uh, when it rounds what was then called Ten Acre Hill and enters the mill pond of the Hamilton Woolen Company at Globe Village. Originally, Globe Village was entirely within the bounds of Sturbridge, and its early history uh, is usually sought from the records from that town. French Canadians arrived from Canada beginning in 1830. Felix Gatineau lists the names of these families in his work. They were French Catholic and arrived from St. Orr. The first Canadians to settle in Southbridge were employees in the Hamilton factories. In 1847, a business of printing Delane was started in the old Woolcott brick mill south of the highway at the bridge. The printing of textile factor, uh, fabrics requires many skilled workmen who had served a long apprenticeship to their several trades and received large compensation for their labor. At this time, most of these tradesmen were English and Scottish. By 1850, there were more than 30 Canadian families, and most of them lived in Globe Village. That same year, a disastrous fire broke out at the Big Mill and destroyed it. In 1856, the inhabitants of Globe Village did attempt to separate from Southbridge and to create their own city. It did not work. They, are st they were still part of Southbridge. And in 1860, the Hamilton Woolen Company built a large brick mill that later became known as the New Mill, which started uh, on cotton in 1863, but shortly after changed over to Worsteds. The trade of the village was co concentrated within a few stores, which carried mixed lines of goods with no outside competition. Just to talk about a few of the notable buildings in Glow Village, that included the uh, Evangelical Free Union Church located on Hamilton Street, which is pictured here at the top left. This church was organized in 1854. Several people who initiated the construction project were executives at the Hamilton Woolen Company, as well as other Globe Village businessmen. This led to it often being referred to as the Mill Church. The large brick structure with a tower that stands today was built in 1869. It was built during a time when the designs of Protestant churches were changing, from the severe and symmetrical Romanesque revival, which is evident in its um, regular fenestration, tight brisk articulation of the brick corbel tables, and round arches, to the more imposing and complicated Victorian Gothic, which is seen in the imposing steeple with polychromatic roof slates, um, and in 1905, the Episcopal congregation named their mission the Holy Trinity Church. Another building uh, is located next door, which you can see in the picture, and that is the three-story stick-style clapboard Alden House, known to be the best example of the stick-style in Southbridge. It was built in 1882 for William E. Alden, who ran a dry goods business in the Alden Block, which he and his father had built. At the time it was built, it was the only building in that stretch of Hamilton Street, with the exception of the church next door and another smaller house. Another important building is the Globe Fire Station, which you can see at the bottom right of the um, screen. This was built in 1894 and is located at the foot of West Street. It's made of brick with a colonial revival influence. It has corner pilasters, segmental arched win windows and doors, and a corbel table that uh, comprises its decorative elements. 
The Hamilton Woolen Company had previously established a fire company and consented to the use of their engine by the town. The first efforts at starting a fire company were actually back in 1832. Dogla Village had a number of stores during the late, 18th, uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries. It had never developed a concentrated commercial center. Two major commercial buildings were the Union Block at Main and Hamilton Streets and the Alden Delahanty Block. Some village stores occupied the ground floor of residential buildings and a few small one-story stores were built. Glow businesses were located on Main Street between Hamilton and Pleasant Streets, as well as on the southernmost end of Pleasant Street itself. Uh, another important building is that center bottom image, uh, the Alden Delahanty block. This was the only large brick commercial um, building ever built in Globe Village and was erected by William, William Alden. In 1888, it housed a grocery store dry goods store, furniture store, uh, a milliner, a barber, and a dentist. John J. Delahanty, the owner of a successful furniture store, purchased the entire block in 1899, also being the only tenant of the building at the time. Though he had begun small, his business grew to eventually take over all three floors of the building, the basement, as well as an additional storehouse. This business remained in the hands of the Delahanty family until 1977, when they sold it to a longtime employee. So now I'm going to talk a little bit of some of Eileen Woodford's work. So she did a, a bunch of work um, several decades ago uh, on historic buildings here in Southbridge. Um, so I just uh, picked a couple of the, the cool ones that um, on this screen are located within Globe Village itself. I'm just going to talk a little bit about them. So the first I'm going to discuss is the Hamilton Mill Brick House, uh, which is that first top right image or top left image, sorry, uh, at 16 High Street, uh, that was built around 1855. It was developed uh, the time of or just before the development of the rest of the High Sales Street area, as a middle class residential area for Hamilton employees. It belonged to the company through the end of the century and possibly into the 20th century. The next building is the Print Works uh, and Cotton Wart Mill, uh, which belonged to the Hamilton Woolen Company, and is that top right image. Uh, it was built in the late 1820s, uh, with a major building um, between 1844 and 1849. Um, this area probably contains the original Woolcott Mill, uh, though a more complete investigation is needed to confirm this. From around 1838 to 1886, a series of connected buildings along the river were the print works for the mill complex. The 1844 Blue Mill, which made cotton warps for delaying production, uh, is possibly located here. The 1849 Cotton Warp um, was built behind the print works. The 1886 Hamilton Woolen closed its production of delays and converted the print works into a worsted production. As Ham the Hamilton Woolen Company expanded into new mills or changed its product line, uh, various buildings in this area were put into retirement or rented out to smaller industrial outfits. One such outfit was the Litchfield Shuttle Company, who rented one of their uh, buildings in the complex from 1843 to 1846 when they moved their own factory further up the river. <laughs> the bottom right uh, at 728 Main Street uh, was built in circa 1817. This house belonged to the Hamilton Woolen Company and was the residence of the mill's agent. The high style design of the house reflects the status of the agent not only in the mills itself, uh, but in the Globe Village community as well. And then now bottom left uh, is the Hamilton Millwright slash agent's house, uh, which sits at 757 to 761 Main Street and was built circa 1840. This house was probably built by the Hamilton Woolen Company uh, for uh, John Edwards Bacon, the millwright who, quote, with the agent Samuel L. Fisk, drew the plans, procured materials, and erected the big mill, then the largest of its kind in the country in 1836. Bacon had come to Southbridge in 1827 uh, and had built breast wheels for numerous local mills. A statement in the Quinnebog Historical Society leaflets number four suggests that others also lived in the same house with Bacon and his family. 
During Mr. Bacon's occupancy of the brick house here at Globe Village, Austin Sumner and William F. McKinstry, who then kept store at the Globe, and Adolphus Merriam and John D. McKinstry, who were in the company's counting room, were members of his family. By 1855, Hamilton's mill agent, Joshua Ballard, lived in the house. Ballard succeeded Samuel Fist as agent and served in the capacity during the period which brought the company into its golden age. So moving on, I'm just going to talk about a couple of the older houses here in Southbridge. This, uh, the earliest dated structures in the town survive uh, usually as rear ells of later farmsteads, reflecting a well-known pattern of retaining the small house of the first generation uh, occupation as an annex to the construction of a later larger house. At the Freeman Pratt Farm, pictured here, in the Bacon Morse Historic District, um, at located at 873 North Woodstock Road. Uh, it is a one and a half story federal style L uh, to the house, which dates to circa 1750. And it is the first structure on the lot. It takes the well-known period form of gable roofed block with a five bay center entry facade and a central chimney. Its only decorative features are the corner boards and the transom over the door. The main house was built in circa 1845 and is Greek Revival in style. Gable end to the street with a side hall entry featuring side lights and a projecting hood do uh, door hood. The pedimented gable is decorated with a blind fan light and this part of the house also has corner boards. Resting on a granite foundation and roofed with slate, the house is one of only two well-preserved federal style farmhouses in Southbridge. It is also among the best preserved examples in the town of a transitional federal to Greek revival style house, featuring the three uh, bay gable front house with federal details. The 19th century barn still stands north of the L, as you can see uh, just to the side there. To the bottom left uh, is the Vinton Boardman House. A rear L of this house, which is located at 93 Torrey Road, also dates to the middle of the 18th century, built in 1760 on land that belonged to the Vinton family since 1738. In 1825, a formal two over two front was added. This house is Southbridge's only well-preserved example of a two-story, five-bay, double-pile federal-style house with a gable roof and end chimneys. The end chimney house plan, which was not unheard of, um, but was much less popular than the central or double chimney plan during the Georgian period, became increasingly popular in the federal period. In central Massachusetts, the majority of end chimney houses appear to have been built between about 1800 and 1830. The home was sold to the Boardman family in 1894, and Miss Harriet Boardman ran a dairy farm on the property. Uh, while her single sister taught school in Southbridge. The back wing was used as a creamery and beneath that laid a root cellar. The top middle picture is of the Amadown Harding House, uh, which dates to pre-1796 and is located at 83 Lebanon Hill Road, and it takes the four bay Cape Cod style house. The date of construction is uncertain uh, because the earliest maps of Southbridge are from 1796 and the house does appear on those, um, but there is no record of it before then. Uh, located on Lebanon Hill Road, which was um, originally a trail and is one of the community's oldest roads, the house is one and a half stories high with a gabled roof, large central chimney, and a clappered exterior. Its architectural features, uh, notably a center chimney, um, suggest that it was built in the years before or just after the American Revolutionary War. Other unique features are overhanging eaves and a transom window over the front door. The barn, a 19th century construction uh, with a couple of bracketed eaves and tongue groove doors, is also a contributing feature. The first documented owner was Cyrus Amadown, a descendant of early settlers of the area. He also appears in local records as one of the first deacons at the local Baptist Church, founded in 1817. Elbridge Harding, who first owned the property, uh, who owned the property by the 1860s, uh, was the son of Joshua Harding, one of the petitioners for the state for the incorporation of Southbridge. 
Down to the bottom right there uh, is the circa 1780 William McKinstry House, located at 361 Pleasant Street. It modifies the five bay Cape Cod house form with end chimneys. Its later alterations include a shed roofed wall dormer over the central three bays and a lateral extension. It is one of the pre-1816 farmhouses in Southbridge, which has not been turned into an L or extension of a later larger farmhouse. Uh, built in 1780 by William McKinstry, uh, who was a British Army soldier who arrived in the area as a deserter in 1748 uh, and was owned by his descendants for many years. At the turn of the 19th century, houses were increasingly built uh, in the large two-story form. Uh, the Simon Plimpton House, um, here in the bottom center, um, was located at uh, 561 South Street. And it's a rare survival in the old Shuttleville area, built in 1819. It was held in the Plimpton family since the early 18th century, but it was flooded later um, by the Army Corps of Engineers. It is a two and a half story, five bay center entry house with uh, the typical central chimney placement, gable roof, double pile of vernacular form that was popular here in central mass from the late 18th through the mid 19th century. While the house was built in 1819, alterations later occurred with the broad eaves and substantial Greek revival door frame appearing to date to the mid 19th century. Despite these and later additions of a porch across the facade, the house remains one of the best preserved examples of 19th century rural architecture in Southbridge. The George Sumner House, which is at the top left, um, was built sometime between 1812 and 1830 and is located at one er, on Page Hill Road. Uh, it is a similar rare survival of the cluster that grew up around the central village, Mill Village. Uh, where Sumner was a key early experimenter in a mechanized textile manufacturer. This is a 2.5 story, late federal wood frame house with a four bay facade, an elliptical fan light at the entry, um, but pre presents its pedimented gable end to the street. And then the most unusual survival from this period uh, is the brick William McKinstry Jr. house. Uh, circa 1815, located at 915 Main Street. Its construction date is unknown, uh, but it is documented in Francis Alexander's 1822 painting of Globe Village. It takes a familiar form of the above described buildings, but it rises to an unusual monitor roof, as you can see there, uh, which is more typically associated with mill buildings. William McKinstry Jr. is the son of an earlier mentioned uh, Southbridge settler uh, who owned one of the houses we discussed in the previous slide. So just some final thoughts here. The town of Southbridge has a rich multifaceted history. Uh, this presentation barely touches on the different aspects and nuances of what and who helped to create the town. I hope you enjoyed this little research project uh, and know that it has actually led to a lot more questions than answers for me. An entire thesis or dissertation could be written on uh, the many aspects of society in this town's history. Um, the location of the town played an important role uh, in the later success of manufacturing companies due the, to the important access to water power from the Quinnebog. I touched on the French-Canadian immigration and employment, on which Felix Gatineau actually wrote extensively about. Um, and I also touched on the architecture of the town, on which more research can definitely be done. Um, I hope that further down the road more research and write-ups occur on the subjects that I got to touch on briefly today uh, and I thank you so much for coming uh, and listening to my talk.